session. Uh, we want to respect your time, so we'll get get started here. I'm going to start to advance our slides. Um, I'm Larissa Garcia. I am the information literacy librarian and the subject specialist for the School of Art and Design, the School of Family and Consumer Sciences, and the Nutrition and Dietetics program in the School of Health Studies. And I'm going to let Deanna um, introduce herself. Hi, I'm Deanna Ferris. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the University Libraries, and I'm the subject specialist for psychology, leadership, educational psychology, and foundations, um, the Center for Women's and Gender Studies, um, the curator of juvenile literature, and um, like Larissa, work on um, OER and textbook affordability issues. Great, thanks. So um, Deanna and I, and actually Tracy, who uh, was just here, we are members of the institution's Course Materials Affordability Task Force. Um, and also um, Jamie, who's also in um, our session today. Um, and this group uh, began as a collaboration between CIDL and university libraries, but now is an expanded to include administrators and, and faculty from across campus. And one of our main objects, objectives is to encourage and support faculty in using free and low cost course materials by providing information and training. So that's why we're having this workshop today and we'll be offering it pretty regularly throughout the year as well. So these are our session outcomes. So hope, we're hoping that by the end of today's workshop, um, you'll be able to describe the impact of no or low cost course materials on student academic success. Um, you will have explored resources for finding relevant disciplinary no or low cost materials. And we'd also hope that you'll be able to, de to determine next steps for including no or low cost materials in your courses. And I'm okay. going to let Deanna take over. Okay. Um, so one of the things that's that's pretty interesting when we start talking about um, no and low cost materials is that most people actually are using some form of these in their classes already. And so um, we just want you to kind of drop into the chat um, at least one free resource that you use in your courses and let us know kind of how you found it. And as kind of an example, um, in the university libraries, we make our own sort of tutorials and videos and infographics, but we also kind of share YouTube videos that were made by other libraries. And so that is a free resource. So um, if you wanna kind of drop into the chat some of the things that you use. Okay, so book chat the chapters through NIU library eBooks. Yes. Other sources that you use. Okay, so a module that you can use that's free. Yeah, government reports. So yeah, depending on what your field is, um, there's loads of government reports, also lots of government videos, um, and again, eBooks, podcasts. Um, yeah, so there's, there's tons of these, and we can kind of talk a little bit more about some of these resources in, in a minute. Um, but it's what's kind of remarkable is how much we really are already kind of engaging in some of these practices. So next slide. Okay. So there's lots of materials out there uh, that are free and low cost, as we said, and you've shared many of them. Um, but it's important to remember the difference between something being free and something being open. So not all free resources are open, but all open educational resources are free. And so when we're talking about open educational resources, referring, we're referring to resources, tools, and practices that are free of legal, financial, and technical barriers, and that can be fully used, shared, and adapted in the, in the digital environment. And so what makes a resource open is the license that the creator or copyright holder gives you to use it so that you can share it or transform it. And the whole idea is that this is supposed to meet your particular needs. COVID-19 has certainly shown us the importance of students having access to course materials remotely. And while several, several companies expanded access temporarily, 
um, and offered free trials to their collections in the early months of the pandemic, um, it did highlight issues of access and how tied we are to publishing companies when it comes to um, educational content. But it did also motivate a lot more faculty to find free options online for their students. There has been important legislative activity this year regarding zero textbook costs or ZTC initiatives. Um, for example, Illinois recently passed the College Course Materials Affordability and Equitable Access Collaborative Study Act, oh, that's a mouthful, um, to create a task force that will study the cost saving methods and practices of public and private higher ed, higher ed institutions in the state. In addition, some states like California, Oregon, Texas, and Washington have already passed legislation requiring educational institutions to label courses that use no cost materials in their courses, um, in their course schedules and registration systems. Illinois actually has some examples of schools that do this. Uh, for example, the College of Lake County and McHenry County College mark courses in the class schedule as low or no cost textbook courses. So $25 or less or $50 or less respectively. And that's actually something our task force is working on as well with the new registrar um, to develop some sort of notation system so that we can put that into the um, NIU registration. Whoops. So these are some of the benefits of using low or no cost course materials. And obviously the most uh, important benefit is that low or no cost materials expand access to learning. Uh, a recent study showed that two out of three students surveyed did not purchase their assigned course materials due to cost. And as you know, this really does impact academic success. Um, some additional benefits of using low or no cost course materials is, is that they can be a good way to supplement um, gaps in the curriculum. Um, they are often easier to distribute widely and quickly, so the information is often very, very current. Uh, low or no cost materials are often easier to edit, adapt, and uh, update, so they are continually being improved. Those are, are definitely some of the benefits, but right now we'd like to hear from you about what are some of the barriers or challenges for faculty um, to using low or no cost course materials. So if you want to, we'll take a minute and if you want to drop that into the chat, we'd love, love to hear what, what some of the barriers or challenges are for you. Vetting the quality. Yes, quality is definitely um, a concern. And some people have put in uh, not peer reviewed. Um, there is some sort of peer review process for some materials and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But yes, we are concerned about the quality. Faculty seem to want the most recent version of a textbook. Yes, it's um, the additions is, and the most current information. That's a, that's a good point to bring up. Reputability, great. These are all great points. And these are actually some of the top reasons that respondents um, noted in uh, the, the course material survey that you might have um, completed earlier in the spring or last spring. Uh, that was actually one of the first initiatives of our task force. So um, these were the top challenges noted by the faculty that submitted that. And at the top of the list, was finding content and really much really related to that is how time consuming it can be. Um, broken links are often a big concern for people. Uh, the permanence of a source. Uh, I see this in my own work as the art librarian. Uh, we have a art reference source, uh, Oxford Art Online, which is not a free resource, it's a database, but several entries include links to external websites, 
um, to exhibitions held at galleries and museums, which is great because that content from those galleries and museums are free and there's lots of images and there's always the proper citation or caption information. So it's really useful for students, but there's always um, lots and lots of broken links in those entries because it's hard for staff to keep up um, updating those. One thing I did want to note about um, challenges getting materials from the library and bookstore cooperation, um, using OERs would definitely address these issues. So for example, while the goal is to use low or no cost course materials in the library, we do have short term strategies to connect students to their course materials. So um, like our textbook purchase program and our course reserves. But budgets and lic licensing are definitely barriers for the library um, for us to provide all the materials for everyone. So that, that makes that really challenging. So low cost or no cost materials are a way for faculty to bypass the middleman, so to speak. Um, now, a lot of you brought up quality in terms of being a concern. Um, and uh, studies actually have shown that generally no cost materials are considered to be as good as or better than traditional textbooks. Um, in one study, students generally did better in classes using OERs versus traditional textbooks. Although it's important to note that this study observed, um, observed this but didn't prove causation, so there might have been other pedagogical strategies in place. Um, ultimately, while the impact on student learning is the same or better, the impact on breaking down barrier, barriers of affordability and accessibility is significant. But the real question is, you know, are they any good? Um, this is the question we sort of get again and again, and it's something that was kind of coming up in chat. And so if you're concerned because um, commercial and scholarly publishing have a long track record and they have inbuilt systems meant to ensure quality control, um, there's a couple of things to sort of think about. And one thing to, to kind of consider is that even if you have a text that is published by a publisher with a reputation for quality, it doesn't mean every book that they produce is of equal quality. And we've all kind of had that experience that, um, say, for instance, you're using one edition of a textbook, a new one comes out, and it actually is not as good as the previous one. Um, there are also been a lot of issues with um, with quality and sort of copy editing in, in recent years, as, um, as some publishers are also kind of cutting their budgets just like um, like we are at the university. And so just because you have a commercial publisher doesn't mean it is a mark of high quality. And when we're talking about um, OER, I mean, pardon me, when we're talking about course materials, um, it was, it's never really a one size fits all situation. And so it's always about sort of determining what works for you and what is your idea of quality. Um, because I'm sure there, there are many of you who are teaching a course that someone else in your department is teaching and you are using different textbooks because you think it meets the specific needs um, for your course. And so you might not agree even within a department and a single, uh, a single class. So, it is absolutely true that OER vary in quality, just like commercial textbooks do. And so just like if you're looking at a textbook that comes from a representative from, you know, from one of the big publishing houses, you're still going to have to kind of do the due diligence and determine whether it actually makes sense to adopt that book. Next slide. And there are some kind of specific things that you kind of have to keep in mind um, when you're thinking about adopting um, OER in a course. And so here's a kind of checklist in, that kind of offers some things that you might want to pay attention to um, when you're considering adopting. And some, some of these are going to look familiar to you because they're the same kinds of things that you do when you're trying, when you're thinking about any textbook. And one thing that's kind of important is that you see here, it says quality at the top, which is what many of you are asking about. Um, it does say, is there peer review available? And while it's not peer review in the same way 
a journal article is peer reviewed. Um, there is this idea that we want specialists um, who understand the field, who are up on the latest research, who are reading and evaluating and then sharing, the, sharing those evaluations with others. And so many of the OER materials do have those reviews attached. If there isn't a review attached, um, then you might want to be more cautious or maybe you want to actually review it yourself. But the whole idea is that we're kind of um, vetting these things and, and sharing. And so that's just like the review process that you have in, in, in within scholarly journals. Um, what's interesting is that there are, um, as the last slide showed, um, a growing number of kind of peer reviews for these materials. Um, and what's interesting is you might sort of expect, oh, everyone sort of gives it a thumbs up. Um, that they, that's this sort of, um, yeah, it's fine and, and, and being relatively generous. Um, but you actually have reviewers who are very vocal about any deficiencies. Um, and yet the, still the vast majority are very, very positive. The other thing that's kind of nice about OER is that unlike a commercially um, published textbook, if there are any problems, if there are any sort of um, inaccuracies, if there are sort of proofreading issues, anything along those lines, they're a lot easier to fix um, with OER. You don't have to wait for a second printing to come around. And so that's, that's kind of one of the positives. But I just want to kind of share this, um, this sort of checklist with you because it is, it is important for you to make decisions about what is going to work specifically for you and your pedagogical needs. And so um, sort of checking on all of these things about reputation, this came up earlier too. Um, you know, how does this fit in with your pedagogy? Um, does, the, does the content seem accurate and up to date? Um, how does it fit with your learning um, objectives and outcomes? appropriate reading level, all of this information is, is probably useful to use regardless of what, whether it's a commercially produced textbook or not. And I did drop in the chat um, a link to a faculty worksheet that you can use um, as you are finding um, OER to, you can use that to determine what you need and then help with evaluating it as well. So next slide, please. Okay, and so we, we already kind of alluded to this when we were discussing the various kinds of low and no cost materials that you're already using. Um, but one of the things that's remarkable is how much is really out there. Um, there are so many different types. And so I, I was kind of joking with someone who was saying, well, you know, really what's out there? And I, and I basically said, you know, you can find an out of um, copyright edition of Hamlet that's been digitized, a sound clip of a bowling alley, which we actually um, played in, in, a, in an earlier workshop uh, that I got from the U of I, um, an image of a painting um, by Frida Kahlo. Um, and, you know, we're talking about a lot of these kind of absolutely free resources, but there are also low cost resources. So you can get like a $1.99 streaming rental of JAWS in case that sort of fits in with your particular teaching needs. Next slide. So one of the other things that kind of came up in the, in the surveys, concerns people had, is about how you go about finding low or no cost materials. And most people, I mean, when, when they're beginning any search, um, whether you're in the academy or not, is going to our friend, Dr. Google. Um, and there, there's plenty of good stuff to be found by going through Google. Um, so it's a very useful tool. Um, but there are also other ways to find materials. And so we want to kind of help you find ones that are a bit more targeted. Um, so first, you can make use of um, library licensed uh, materials. And so this is something that kind of came up in the chat earlier. And so you can use Husky Search um, to kind of look through our materials for ebooks, for journal articles, access through our databases, or streaming video that we've subscribed to. Um, but I really want to kind of um, note uh, um, that there is some danger um, it, of, of just sort of going in and automatically sort of assuming that um, texts that have been available in the past will still be available or materials that you sort of found in a repository of eBooks, um, whether we actually own it. And so what I kind of say and what, what all of us say is 
before you assign library license resources for a course, check with your subject specialist librarian to ensure that the item is available, is available to everyone, and is available when everyone needs it. Um, and this, the issue with this is that not all ebooks um, actually allow for unlimited users. So when we purchase a license to it, um, many of them are designed to only be used by one person at a time, just like a physical book. Um, sometimes we can get licenses that allow for unlimited users and whenever it is financially possible to do so, um, we try and do that. But it is not always an option. And so even um, a book that um, has an ebook version um, of a textbook that you're currently using, even if the students can buy an ebook, that doesn't mean the, the university libraries can buy that ebook because some of them are really not to be de not designed to be used by multiple people. Um, so just kind of be aware of that. The other thing to kind of be aware of is that um, streaming video, say through Canopy, uh, we buy those for um, a, a, with a license that lasts for a year. And so it's a year from the date that you buy it. And so if you were using it last year, we don't automatically renew them because we don't know if you're going to continue to use them. And so if there is a, a film that you've been using from Canopy or some other streaming service, um, it's a really good idea to contact your subject specialist librarian and say, when does this license run out? Um, can we um, go ahead and resubscribe to it so we can continue to use it? Um, because we wanna make sure that um, if you put it on your syllabus, it's going to be there when the students need it. Um, the other thing to kind of uh, be aware of is that um, there are a lot of repositories of free materials out there, and many that um, sort of are specifically focused on OER, open textbooks, and other, um, other materials that you can reuse and remix. And they also allow you a lot of kind of freedom about what you do with those materials. So you can kind of take bits and pieces of them and make them into something that is kind of bespoke, that's something that really works for your specific classes. And so we want to kind of direct you to some of those kind of resources, which allow you um, so much kind of greater freedom and much greater control. And so um, if we can kind of put into the chat um, the link to the finding and accessing content for courses. Okay. So we've put together um, a, a research guide um, that has a lot of resources on finding low and no cost materials. Um, but one of the things specifically here is the various kind of repositories where you can search um, to find these materials that have these kind of open licenses. Okay. So um, we just want to ask you this question, since we've already been kind of asking you questions about, you know, what helps you sort of um, choose, what are some of the barriers, but if you're looking for materials for your courses, um, what is most important to you? If you could drop those in the chat, that would be great. So what would you like um, a, a free or low cost um, item to, to do for your course, um, for your students? What do you want from it? And you can talk about the sort of process about finding it. Okay, content in a usable way. Um, teaching supports, yeah, so having the kind of ancillary materials like PowerPoints and quizzes, because that's one of the appeals of the commercially produced products. Yes, no extra non-covered content, absolutely. So something where it, you, you get everything, uh, you don't have to kind of pick and choose. Okay. Reliable information, easy to access. Yeah, these are these are all really great and, and incredibly important uh, because a lot of what um, Larissa was talking about in terms of, of barriers, the things that you're talking about are about taking down some of those barriers and allowing people to, to have greater access to the text and then when they have it, to be able to have a full range of, of what's associated with that text. Okay, uh, yes, this idea of aligning with accreditation standards. Great, thank you so much. Um, I want you to kind of keep these ideas in mind 
uh, because we're going to kind of move over and do an activity um, so that you can actually work on trying to find um, OERs and open textbooks. So I'm going to turn it over to Larissa. So what we'd like you to do, I'm going to drop a link into the chat that will take you to a chart. Um, we're going to assign, we assigned everyone an OER resource to explore. Um, we'd like you to think of a topic and then search for your topic in your assigned resource and then complete uh, the chart that everyone has access to. So I'm going to stop sharing uh, this PowerPoint and show the chart. Hmm. Let me fix that. I think it might ask you to log in as with your AID and password. Oh, great. So again, we assigned everyone, hopefully we did this right, fingers crossed, we assigned everyone a resource. So if you want to pick a topic that you would want to address in your course, search for that in the resource. And if you right click onto the resource, um, you can open up a new tab for that. Um, we'd like to know the topic, the number of results, um, if you found any uh, textbooks there, and then choose just one item that you found. Um, share the title, if you can find any licensing information, um, were there any um, ancillary information like lecture notes or slides or quizzes, and if there's also any reviews available. We're going to give you about five minutes for this.
So as you're finishing up, we'll give you a couple more minutes. Um, just a, a note about the resources that we are having you explore. Um, all of these are listed on that subject guide that Deanna was talking about um, a, a little bit um, earlier. Uh, we have put together this resource that includes um, a bunch of places that you can go, and they are all um, open resources on the web. Um, these are all listed there. Some of them um, might be um, more general uh, or subject specific. We've got some subject specific textbooks listed there as well. And we also have um, a few of these are places that you can go to search um, several di different um, collections. And Deanna has uh, dropped that link to the subject guide again in the chat. Um, so all of these resources are available on this guide. We should also say that we're kind of constantly updating this. And so when new resources and new repositories become available, we're, we're adding these in so, um, so that you have as many options as possible to find what you need. Okay, last 30 seconds, you wanna finish up? Okay, thanks everyone for completing the chart. It looks like mostly everybody got through, got through all of the, the columns. So we'd kind of just like to, to hear from you about the experience of, of searching here. I mean, this is a very, you know, kind of quick uh, sort of look at, at some of these sources. And one of the things just looking at the, um, the chart is, it varies a lot based on um, which particular resource you're looking at, what particular topic you're you're researching. But we'd really love for you to, um, if you feel comfortable, um, unmuting and um, telling us a little bit about uh, what the experience was like. Um, you can, you know, tell us about the process. You can tell us if you found a really great um, resource that you'd like to explore more. Um, did it look like there were a lot of um, resources available? Was it easy to navigate? Any of those things. Um, so if you'd like to either drop a comment in the chat or even better, if you'd like to kind of um, talk to us uh, with your voice, um, we'd love to hear from you. I can talk about mine. Um, I had OpenStax and it was relatively easy to navigate the website overall. And it seems kind of more geared towards math and science for subjects. Um, so a lot of like algebra, calculus, statistics, um, that kind of thing. And a little bit less in the social sciences or humanities, I would say. Yeah, thanks so much for that observation. One, one of the things that's interesting is OpenStax. Open um, 
which is through Rice University. Um, they actually are producers of open educational resources. And so they're ones that they kind of make in-house. Um, they're supported by grants and foundations. And so these are all only the texts that they have created. And you're right, there's a lot of focus on, on sort of math. Um, there's um, you know, some in, in the sciences. So I, I believe you have sort of uh, chemistry and biology, um, a little bit lighter in, in the social sciences, um, though I think they're, they're sort of building on it. Um, but yes, um, so th these are, are ones that are usually pretty high re highly regarded, but they have fewer since they're making them themselves. Uh, so that's a, that's a really interesting observation. So in the chat, I see that um, Daniel was talking about the time limitation <laughs> is intense. Um, it's true. Um, one of the things, though, is that it's surprising sometimes how much you can find in five minutes. Um, you don't always find exactly what you want um, with those sorts of time pressures. And also, if you're only looking in a single repository or a single one of these links, um, you may not find what you want. Um, but there are some interesting possibilities. And this idea of kind of broad, whether you want to go broad or narrow, again, some of these may, uh, may vary based on which kind of resource you're looking at. Is there anybody else who'd like to get on and share? Tell us about your experience. Did you find something that you think, hey, I might actually look into that? Or did it feel like there was a kind of paucity of information um, on the topic you were searching? It, it's great. I mean, one of the things that's that's sort of surprising is that when you're trying to kind of find a textbook or other kind of course materials through this method, it could be kind of um, intimidating that it isn't always clear where to start. That's one of the reasons we wanted to have this exercise is because you immediately start looking and you you might find things or at least you, you know, you've at least kind of explored what's possible, what's out there in a single resource. And so it takes some of the pain and anxiety out of it, just sort of taking that first step. And so again, you may not have found um, the textbook or the materials of your dreams um, in that five minutes, um, but it's, it's a relatively painless process and something you can kind of repeat doing some of these others. And of course, there's also the option of working with your subject specialist librarian to try and find much more kind of targeted, more specific materials um, because they have more of a sense of, of what you, you particularly need than say we do, um, talking more generally about this. Um, but there's also that kind of opportunity to say, I really want these aspects. So I want ancillary materials. I want to make sure that there are PowerPoints. I want to make sure that there are quizzes. And so working with a subject specialist librarian, you might actually be able to, to kind of divide up some of the work and find ways um, to access this information. Well, thank you so much for participating in, uh, in our uh, sort of little activity. Okay, so the last thing we really wanted to do, to do today was to kind of talk about ways to help you commit to next steps. Um, and so we kind of want to give you just a couple of minutes to think about what you might do after the session. And obviously we're not holding you to this, um, but what are some ways to, to go from, you know, a lot of people have uh, participate in webinars or workshops that talk about um, free or low cost materials, but how are you going to get to that, that next step and what do you do after you've kind of had a workshop? And so we'd like you to just, just take a couple of minutes and say, you know, what's something that you can do to, um, to implement some of what you've learned um, from today? And there are various possibilities. Um, you know, you could uh, 
go ahead and reach out to a subject specialist librarian, as we were just talking about. Um, if you're really committed um, to textbook affordability, you could volunteer to be on the course materials affordability task force, like several of us in this meeting. Um, but what do you think? Um, what kinds of ways can you sort of move from this session into implementation? Okay, so shopping on the link above to see what I can find. Great. Share with faculty. Excellent. One of the things that's sort of nice is um, some people who've started kind of working on sort of finding free and, and low cost materials, um, they do kind of bring it to um, to their departments and committees on their departments so that they can talk about, is there the possibility of finding a free or low cost um, text that we can use across the various um, course sections uh, of a particular class, especially in a class where there are, um, there are a lot of students. Okay, More strategic keyword searching for your spring 2022 course topics. Yes, excellent. And this, it's hard to be thinking about spring 2022 at this point, but it's really great if you could start doing it now. Um, it's, it's much easier to make that kind of shift from a commercial textbook far in advance than at the last minute. Excellent, so, uh, so bookmarking all of the, the sites that are on here. And definitely bookmark the find um, part of the LibGuide. There are other materials on that LibGuide too um, that can be sort of helpful to you um, as you're kind of going through the process. Um, but definitely the one that helps you find materials can be great. There's Larissa putting it in the chat again. <laughs> Anything else that you'd like to add? These are all really great suggestions. Thank you so much for spending time thinking about it and participating. Thanks for participating, everybody, and attending. And so now, um, if you have any questions, we're happy to answer those. You can put them in the chat, or you can unmute yourself. Welcome. Um, I'm also, as soon as I find it, I'm going to put into the chat our um, directory to for your subject guides. So if you don't know who your subject specialist librarian is, and you'd like to talk to them about um, OERs or finding low or no cost materials, uh, then you can contact them directly and they can work with you. Um, Jamie has asked if we have uh, found faculty members at NIU who are currently developing OER materials. You know, we haven't, and that is going to be one of the objectives for the task force um, to hopefully research a way to offer incentives so that um, not only will faculty be adopting um, or adapting OERs, but also um, creating some. So we hope that that'll be part of, of the work that, of the task force. You're welcome. And there are some resources on the guide um, about how to adopt, how to adapt, as well as how to create um, your own open educational resources. Um, It's, you know, mostly at this point, we're sort of focused on um, adopting and adapting, but as Larissa points out, I mean, it would be great if um, faculty on campus were creating their own materials that are, um, that are open, that kind of make use of open pedagogy. So something that, that really benefits from the, um, that sort of adaptable nature of, of those resources. So um, that could definitely be exciting in our, in our maybe not so distant future. <laughs> um, 
Well, thanks everyone. We'll hang out. Um, Deanna and I will hang out for yeah. a few minutes. So if you do have any questions or want to put them in the chat, but otherwise, thanks for thanks for coming and for participating. Yes, thanks you so much, everybody. Have a great day. Be safe. Deanna, do you know about Apple Books? Daniel is asking, um, Apple Books is not on the LibGuide. It, it's also a work in prog progress, that yes. guide is. So we might not have just had a chance to go through the source to, you know, to vet it, because um, we'll always be adding to it. So that's probably what the, the case is that we just haven't gotten yeah. to it yet. Um, there is a place on that guide if there are specific resources that um, that you found are are really um, useful and that seem of, of good quality um, that you can sort of suggest those and we can put them on. We're always looking for more, um, but they're constantly sort of coming up, and so it's it's easy to miss even when we're keeping an keeping an eye out for it. Um, so that's one I will certainly look into. You're Very welcome. welcome. Thanks. I'm making a note.